get started here in our Sunday school hour with a song uh, and a verse. And uh, we have um, our new song for the month of June that we've been singing when morning gilds the sky. And so we'll sing that this morning as well. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Hebrews 1 8, the Bible says, Unto the Son he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Amen. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his reign. And so we honor him this morning and stand together and sing this song that uh, proclaims throughout May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen. So lift your voice and praise the Lord this morning. <laughs> so clearly declares lord we uh, do that this morning lord with our songs with our prayers with the preaching and teaching of god's word lord with the spirit of our fellowship together lord may jesus christ be praised in all of it Amen. thank you for allowing us to meet together this morning lord we know a number of our folks are away uh, families are away vacation lord we just pray that you'd minister to them and be with them as they're away and bring them back safely uh, lord to their homes and to the fellowship of the saints here at Liberty. Lord, bless our day in, in, uh, in the Word and in Christ today, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be seated this morning. Let's uh, take a few prayer requests, mention anything we need to uh, mention, add to our prayer list this morning. I know we have, as I mentioned in prayer, a number of folks either uh, traveling or preparing to travel, and so the Jenkins are uh, on, on vacation, so pray for them. And uh, the McCabe's are on vacation uh, visiting their grandkids in Idaho. They made it safely there, so keep them in prayer. Uh, and then uh, who else? I know Lucas and, uh, is, is preparing for a trip, uh, getting his testing done to fly out. He'll be gone for 
uh, sometime uh, next uh, whole week or so, about really, a week, yes. about a week uh, down into Mexico, visiting family and things down there. So keep that in prayer as he travels. Mm -hmm. And uh, then also um, others will be traveling pretty soon. I know the Hendricks are going to be going mm -hmm. on vacation soon as well. Uh, just a lot, a lot of folks, summertime traveling, and some have uh, come back and joined us again. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. Um, also, we have evangelism uh, coming up, that uh, big conference coming up in July. That's another prayer request we can put before the Lord. But the Lord would use that time that we minister on the streets and, uh, and uh, also any other time we're out uh, leading up to that as well. Pray for, uh, pray for the Garlands. Brother Garland was here. And he preached yesterday at our men's uh, um, Father Son Barbecue. It was uh, great. Uh, did a great job preaching uh, principles of of uh, fatherhood and uh, and he they woke up this morning and uh, his wife is not feeling well she oh. had some kind of stomach bug or something and so they decided to head back home so uh, keep them in prayer and uh, they were staying with the with the with the trombos and so uh, pray that that will, whatever it was didn't get didn't get passed around to everybody <laughs> amen so keep her in prayers they travel back home this morning so what else we need to mention mention today anything else the Pete yeah. Continue to keep the rancher ministry in prayer. Um, keep uh, Adriana in prayer that she continues to heal up. Uh, keep uh, Jose in prayer for salvation. Uh, keep me in prayer uh, at the, on the 18th of next month. I have an appointment uh, to fix what I got. Uh, yesterday, I couldn't make it. I was going to come, but I woke up in pain and my stomach was not feeling well. That's what I'm going to go to the... Uh, I'm going to have surgery uh, for. I uh, also pray for uh, uh, my my earthly family, my sisters and brothers for salvation, and then to come back to church. Amen. Amen. All right. What else we need to mention this morning? Anything else? All right. Well, praise the Lord. Let's uh, take a few moment, moments then and go to the Lord in prayer as we uh, remember those traveling, those ill, uh, all the requests that have been put before us. Uh, mention those before the Lord this morning and pray as we uh, uh, prepare our heart for the day of worship together. Amen. So let's do that now.
Pastor Christian Torres' wife, I think we mentioned this on Wednesday night, Christian Torres, he pastors at Riverside Baptist uh, uh, Church, and his wife is in need of a heart transplant. And I believe she, uh, the last report she made, the, the transplant list, right? Yeah. They put her on the list. Yeah. So there's 10,000 people, about 10,000 people in the United States that uh, are on the heart transplant list. About 2,500 of them every year actually get the heart that is needed for transplant. And that's not just because the, 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 you know, the organs are not available as much as everything has to match up exactly right. Yeah. You know? So about 2,500 people are able to get a good match every year. And so she's in some serious need there of a heart transplant. So uh, keep that in prayer if you would. Yeah. As uh, she's, she's the, I, I don't know all the details of the story, but she is, is weak and just has a lot of trouble and is in a hospital, in the hospital because she's to the point where, unless I think she's got full-time medical, is that probably about right? Unless yeah. she's got full-time medical care, she can't really survive outside of the hospital care right well, now. Well, plus two, um, they're afraid, you know, like COVID and all that right. kind of stuff, they want to keep her in right. that situation. So that's a prayer. And then also, I think they got five five little ones, right? Five yeah. kids. And so the, the kids are without their mom right now, and they, they're they only allowed in, in to see her like like an hour a week. Yeah. And so pray for the family. It's, they're going through a very, very difficult time. Uh, Brother Christian Torres and his wife, Brittany Torres. So if you remember that. And then I just was made, it was made known to me that the Sister Perla's daughter, Kathy, is uh, getting ready, or not like immediately, like this morning, but she's about to about to have the, the new baby. So uh, if you keep that in prayer as she is, uh, uh, close to delivery. Amen. Mm -hmm. So praise the Lord for that. Psalm 19 this morning is where we'll turn for our uh, Psalter time. Psalm 19. And uh, we'll read these verses 7 through 14 and then we will sing the uh, Psalter selection from this passage. So Psalm 19, a familiar passage of Scripture. And focusing on the Word of God as it is presented in this passage of Scripture, the law of the Lord and uh, the testimony of the Lord. We know this, this passage well. We sing other psalm courses, uh, other psalm chorus to this passage. But in uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Mm -hmm. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So we have this uh, passage in the Psalter selection that corresponds to this passage from Psalm, uh, Psalter 19b. And the tune is Rejoice, the Lord is King. So it's a familiar, familiar tune. There's five verses. So let's sing this out to the Lord this morning. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
Let's take our Bibles this morning and we'll go to uh, Jude, uh, Ch Jude, the third verse. Jude, the third verse, only one chapter in Jude. Use this as a springboard to jump into uh, a new series. We've uh, preached through or taught through our series on the attributes of God and uh, in a profitable time as we attempt to get an understanding, a glimpse of who God is from the scriptures and hopefully some uh, some uh, uh, new uh, insights that were gained by doing kind of a detailed study of, of uh, the uh, character traits or the divine perfections of God. And uh, there's so much more that we could have said in each one of those and probably expanded into some other uh, character traits as well, uh, but tried to hit the main ones, the the, core, the key ones that uh, would give us an understanding. But that is a that is a subject that is um, you know that is uh, something we'll never exhaust when we're studying the scriptures. And and so uh, I would encourage each one of you to uh, begin to or continue in your study of the character traits of God, the divine perfections of God, and and continue learning about who He is, uh, getting a, a knowledge of God, Amen. And so, uh, hopefully, that was a blessing to you, and open your eyes to some things, and help you think about some things in a different way, uh, with regard to how we approach the Scriptures and what we believe about, um, you know, about uh, how God interacts with man, how man is to interact with God, um, how God uh, is involved in our salvation, and his salvation is of the Lord, and each one of those character traits and and divine perfections are somehow intric intricately involved in and connected to uh, how God uh, in, involves himself with us and directs us and, and saves us and all those things. And so uh, with that said, we move on to another series that I want to do that's another doctrinal series that I think is important to do. And this one is a doctrinal series that's very closely connected to our statement of faith, our confession of faith as a church. And so um, uh, we'll probably have some overlap from the last one. Uh, when we're talking about the attributes of God, but uh, not a whole lot, but uh, just kind of working our way through uh, conf our confession of faith. And so we're going to start with Jude 1.3 as our, as our springboard text for this series, where Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So that last part of that verse is very important to what we are attempting to do here with this doctrinal series. The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. All right. And so Jude exhorts the Christians to whom he writes to earnestly contend for this thing that he calls the faith. Um, and and it, every aspect of that phrase is so so important. When he says, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered, we're going to kind of break that down today as an introduction uh, to uh, this series and hopefully make some sense of why each one of those parts of that verse are so important. And I, I think there's uh, four things or five things I think that I got here that are, are um, points of highlight, points of emphasis in that verse that are necessary for us to get a hold of and grasp. And the first thing that we see in this exhortation is the existence of this thing called the faith. We want to highlight that. That's what we're really talking about, the faith. And uh, the faith, as Jude uses it here, is a body of beliefs that comprise the whole of Christian doctrine. And not just Christian doctrine, not just the black and white, not just the on the on the page, not you know, not just that which we open the Bible and read, but the the practice or the fruit of that doctrine as well, how we live that doctrine out. So when we say that we're studying the faith, um, yes, that is a very theological thing. It's a very heady thing. Uh, it's something that we do with our minds. It's, it could be a very academic thing, intellectual thing, but it's more than that. It's a practical thing, uh, a, a faith that is not lived out. Uh, these truths that are not lived out, that are not practiced in everyday life, are really worthless. They're, they're pointless. And so when we're talking about the faith, we're not merely talking about the intellectual aspect or the theological aspect of our beliefs, though that is the foundation upon which we build this whole concept of what the faith is. 
we are also saying that those beliefs, every one of those beliefs, have a practical application in our life. They they mean something uh, in our life on a daily basis. They direct us in our life on a daily basis. They cause us to believe a certain way, to behave a certain way, uh, to act a certain way. And so this this concept of the faith is is what has what the Christians believe and how they behave on the basis of what they believe or as a result of what they believe. It's been administered to the church. It's been given to the church by the Spirit of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the prophets, and through the apostles. If you will, go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We find there Paul um, talking to the church at Ephesus. Very important that we remember that this letter is directed to the church. And so when he addresses them, He's addressing them not only, of course, as individuals that make up the body of Christ, but he is addressing them in a corporate way as well. This is the body of Christ that he's talking to, all right? The church, a local church, by the way, uh, which is which is very important here. In ver verse number 19 of chapter 2, he says, Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He says, you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So there's three aspects, he says, to the foundation of the church. The church is built upon the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. We know that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock I will build my church. He was talking about the rock of truth, the statement that Peter made, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This truth statement, this is the foundation of the church, right? Jesus Christ himself, he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so in addition to Jesus being the cornerstone, the foundation, the cornerstone of the foundation of the church, he is included in that through the through the Spirit by Paul, that the prophets and the apostles are also included in that in that concept of the foundation, what the church is built upon. And we know that's a direct reference basically to the scripture, right? It is a reference to the scripture. The prophets wrote scripture. The apostles wrote scripture. Jesus Christ himself wrote scripture. They always appealed to scripture as the foundation, as the basis for our faith, the basis for our beliefs. And so when he says this, he says they're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Look at verse 21. He says, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, unto an holy temple and uh, temple in the Lord. So he's talking now about the building that is being constructed upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ. As the as the uh, Jesus Christ as the, the those three combined as the uh, foundation. Jesus being co the cornerstone, of course. He says in verse twenty two, in whom right in Christ, he also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so by the by the the foundation that's laid, and then the construction upon the, the foundation that is laid, which is the church, we form a house, a dwelling place of God, uh, for, uh, of God uh, by His Spirit, for His Spirit in the earth. Peter said, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he said, uh, he said, you're lively stones that, that make, a, make up a spiritual house, right? And so he said, you're, we're, we're each like, like a stone, a part of the construction, each one of us as Christians, and we're built upon this foundation. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he also talks about Jesus being the, the cornerstone. So he mentions the foundation. And, and as the foundation, then, then us, each individual uh, person, is placed like a... Like if you if you were to picture a, a a house of a structure made out of blocks, building blocks, right? Well, a lot of times we don't do that. We don't we don't see that as much in our Western uh, society or Western culture because many of our buildings are built with uh, with uh, uh, they're they're built uh, they're built with, with uh, stick framing and stucco and things like that. But obviously, in that day, this day and age, the the concept or the the, the predominant way of building was stones, was stone uh, uh, masonry, and so you would you would start stacking stones. 
you know, uh, whether it be bricks or, or, or uh, concrete blocks or whatever the case may be, or, or, or um, adobe uh, or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, stone that had been chiseled and cut and shaped from larger pieces of stone, and they would begin to stack and stack. I mean, the pyramids are an example of that. All those buildings that time, that's how they would build. And so he, he likens us as, as an individual stone in the building process. And so each one of us here this morning are some portion of the greater building that is being built he says we're lively stones and we make up a spiritual habitation the spirit of god dwells in the church that is made up of all these different stones connected together jesus is the foundation the apostles and prophets uh, um, also part of the foundation so a habitation of god how important is the house that is built, the church? It is very important. It is the habitation of the Spirit of God. He is chosen. We know that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. We know that He does not need to uh, dwell in a, in a physical building, of course. And we're not talking about the physical building that we're meeting in today. We're talking about we're talking about the uh, uh, the spiritual building that is the church, the house of God, the people of God, uh, and we know that God doesn't even need to dwell in those so in, in us as, to, as as individual temples, but He's chosen to. This is the place that He's chosen to dwell, and so by God dwelling in each of our hearts by faith, according to Ephesians chapter two. Um, two and three, uh, three actually, and then uh, other places we know uh, that, that the same type of language is used. According, according to that, God dwelling in our hearts by faith, uh, taking up residence in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Then when we come together as the church, the house of God, the Spirit of God is there, present. He's present in a very unique way in His church. And so these are important truths that we, we need to understand as we build uh, this foundation. So that was the first thing. The first thing is the existence of this thing called the faith that is the body of doctrine. And as a result of that doctrine, the practice of the saints, of, of the church, uh, um, uh, by the uh, being ministered by the by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, the prophets and apostles. The second thing that we learn from our uh, verse here, our text, is that the body of the, this body of doctrine and right practice that's called the faith is it com is complete as it was once delivered. All right, it's complete as it was once delivered to the saints. That means that it's no longer being delivered to the saints. What, that, what I mean by that is that there's nothing new, right? We're not getting new doctrine. We're not getting new revelation. Uh, the revelation of the canon of Scripture has been closed when John penned the, the last book of Scripture, uh, last book of the Bible, uh, that was done. It was closed. There was nothing new coming from God in terms of, of, um, of revealed truth from heaven. It's done. It's closed. It's settled. There's no more. We look back to uh, this revealed truth to receive it. We're not looking for somebody to come in and stand up and give us a word from the Lord, right? Right? Uh, if they give us a give us, if somebody came in and stood up and said, "I have a word from the Lord," uh, the first thing we ought to do is 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 begin our our our, uh, our red flag meter ought to be uh, being be up and 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 so what in the world is going to be said here, right? And we automatically, according to First John, begin to try the spirit of this. And so somebody stands up, they say, "I have a word from the Lord," or maybe one of your friends say, "I have a word from the Lord from you," and uh, they give you some word. And it's completely contrary to Scripture because Scripture is your is your test. Scripture is your guide, right? They say, well, we know that wasn't from the Lord. How do you know? Because the canon of Scripture is closed. The revelation of God has been given to us. We test it in light of the Word of God. And if it's contrary to the Word of God, surely it's not of God because God does not contradict Himself, right? So your word from the Lord was not from the Lord. If you were, if we were in the old uh, Old Testament, we could stone you for that, right? Maybe we still should for people to talk like that, right? So we'll say, well, what if what they said was consistent with God's Word? Well, then why did they say it? What did you need it for? If it was already stated in God's Word, what was the purpose of it? Why, why come in and say, this is a word from the Lord? Yeah, you said the same exact thing the Bible already says. Why would we need you to say that again and tell us it's a word from the Lord unless you had your Bible open and was reading it right out of the Scripture, Right? So if, we, if whatever your word from the Lord is is consistent with what the Bible says, it wasn't, it wasn't a special revelation. He already told us, right? 
So it's not a word from the Lord. And so very, very important that we get this idea, this concept, this truth from the Scripture that the faith was once delivered to the saints. It's no longer being delivered. It's already been delivered. Its sum and substance can be found in the pages of Scripture. With the, expect, with the expectation that nothing is absent or lacking from it, and all that is present is sufficient to communicate all that God intends for us. This might be the, the question of maybe we, we come to the Scripture and we're reading through the Scripture and we see things like Paul writing that other letter to the Corinthian church. Remember we talked about that as we preached through First uh, Corinthians so far, uh, that there was a third letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church. Or in Paul's writings there is, a, um, there is, a, um, there is a, a reference to a letter that he wrote to the church at Laodicea, but we don't have that letter, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, we see a couple different places where the uh, Bible references a, a book called the book of Jasher, right? You've read that before in your Old Testament. And there's other places where we see some things that it seems like when, if we were to look at, a, look at them from, just from a surface observation from the Scripture, like, oh, this is, this is other inspired Scripture. Well, we need that. Well, no, you don't need that. Even if it was, we're not even. We don't even know if it was inspired scripture. There's no reference to it actually being inspired scripture, right? There's just it's just a a, a book or writing that was referenced in the scripture. No, nowhere do we see that it was actually inspired scripture, like the letter to Laodicea or the other letter to Corinth. We can't prove because it doesn't exist, and we don't even need to prove that it, that, it, that it is inspired Scripture, but we could never prove that because it doesn't exist. And so we say, what do we do with that? We're missing something. No, you're not missing anything. God's perfectly giving you exactly what you need in the Bible, right? Uh, if, you don't have, if we don't have the letter to Laodicea or the other letter to Corinth or the book of Jasher, it's because we don't need those books. Amen? Yes, sir. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and uh, one of the ways that we test certain books that we do have is in light of the Scripture that we know to be true. And we see it with, like with the apocryphal books, right? Uh, there are things that are written in those apocryphal books that are contrary to what the Bible says doctrinally, so we reject them. Now, are, does that mean that those books are completely worthless? No, that doesn't mean that they're completely worthless. Uh, there, there is good historical content in some of those books. We wouldn't know anything about the Maccabees unless we had those books and, and Hanukkah and, and how they fought and the lamp, the, 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 the lamp stayed lit for all those. That's a, an accurate historical event that was told in one of those books. But there is also things in First and Second Maccabees that are contrary to the Bible, right? Why? Because it was just the writing of a man. It was not Scripture. He was simply telling historical events that took place. And so you look to some of those, you say, okay, we can, we can appreciate some of that material as history, but just like any man written history, there's going to be flaws in it. There's going to be errors in it, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, we, yeah, that's right. And there are certain things that God said, I don't want them to know this. They can't know this. They can't appreciate. Paul said there's things he saw in the third heaven that he, it wouldn't be lawful for him to even, even record them. Right, And so what we can trust and know is that what we do have is exactly what God wants us to have, right? Does that mean that there's, there's not, that, does that mean that there's not any more uh, knowledge than what we have in the Bible? Oh no, God's knowledge is infinite. <laughs> there's plenty more that we don't have, but we know what we do have is perfectly sufficient for us in this life, all right? And so this idea of the faith, it was once delivered, um, and what we have presently is sufficient to communicate all that God intends for us. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, you're familiar with these passages. If you want to turn, though, 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 14, But continue thou in the things that thou, which thou hast learned and hast uh, been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child that's known the Holy Scriptures. So Paul says, I want you to continue, Timothy, in the things you've learned and you've been assured of. You've known these things and you got these things. You got these truths from the Scriptures, right? Paul specifically designated that which was written down that God's approval was upon. And that's where Timothy learned and understood the faith that was delivered to him, all right? Verse 15 again, and that from a child that's known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in, G in Christ Jesus, 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You say, well, I just feel like I'm missing something because I don't have the Epistle to Laodiceans. Well, the Epistle of Laodiceans would have had nothing, added nothing to the ability for the Scripture you do have to, com to make you complete and com completely mature in the faith. So if it adds nothing to it, if you don't need it, then quit worrying about it, right? Well, what about the book of Enoch? Quit worrying about the book of Enoch, right? Quit worrying about it. Bible mentions it? Yes, mentions it. Actually, the Bible doesn't even mention the book of Enoch. The Bible references the book of Enoch a couple of times, but never says anything about the book of Enoch. References a couple things that, the, that Enoch said as a prophet. And everybody said, well, that's recorded in this book, this ancient book called the book of Enoch. If God did not include it in Scripture, don't worry about it, right? Don't worry about it. Uh, and, and so we, we take what God did give us and understand that, it's, that it, is, it is equipped to truly furnish us um, to become perfect, uh, mature as Christians. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 uh, speaks to this as well. It says, according as his divine power, Second Peter 1, 3, and 4, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Where do we get those? In the scripture. We get those promises, these exceeding great and precious promises in the scripture, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so he's, been, he's given us the divine power uh, through divine knowledge with, that contains the promises, right? The promises that help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're complete. We don't need anything else. And so the first thing that we looked at here is that there is this thing called the faith, and that's the body of doctrine that results in godly practice. That, and then the second thing is this faith was once delivered, and we don't need anything else but the faith that was once delivered unto the saints for uh, spiritual maturity. The third thing that we see is we see that this body of doctrine called the faith has been committed to the care of the saints. It was given to or delivered to the saints, according to our text, and in, into their hands as the responsible party. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've just come through that, preaching through that uh, in our uh, Sunday series, Sunday morning series. But just to remind you of uh, how this thing works, the faith that we're speaking of was delivered or put in the hands of uh, to be the responsible party, the church, God's people. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Remember that term ordinance, ordinance there is divinely ordained or divinely instituted tradition. Paul was saying, I didn't give you my own opinion. I didn't come up with some cultural mandate. I gave you the words of God. They were divinely ordained. They were divinely ordered things that I communicated to you. He says, keep them that I've delivered unto you. And then look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says much the same thing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, uh, Therefore, brethren, verse 15, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. And so Paul said, I have communicated truth to you. By my own word, he gave it to him by his own word, he preached to them the, God, the, the truth, and by the epistle, the letters that he wrote to them, right? And so he was committed unto them. Once again, read that verse, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. He wasn't talking about man-made traditions. He was talking about the word of God that he had communicated unto them. Uh, the, 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 the divinely ordained or ordered traditions that he had communicated unto them. And so this was, he was just emphasizing or emphasizing the point that this body of doctrine, this thing that we call the faith, has been committed unto the church. It is not the responsibility of the college, the, 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 uh, you know, the, of academia, to hold on to the faith. It's not the responsibility of the secular world in any shape, way, shape, or form to, con to, to maintain the faith. It's the responsibility of God's people in the church to hold on to and maintain and protect and defend the faith that was once delivered. The fourth thing that we see in, the, in our passage 
is that the body of doctrine called the faith is worthy of our protection. That leads right into this. It's worthy of our protection, uh, any protection that we can give it. The phrase earnestly contend, earnestly contend literally means to struggle or fight. That's what it means. To earnestly contend means to struggle or fight. The clear implication is that the faith is valuable and is not vital to the Christian church. This body of doctrine we're talking about is worthy of our earnest efforts to protect it. Right? It's worthy of that. When we see it being attacked, we have to stand up. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Amen. Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. So the clear implication here is that the faith is valuable and vital. The body of doctrine we're talking about is worthy of our earnest efforts to protect. The fact that we're commanded to contend, that word contend, for it also implies that it will be it will be under attack. If if Jude says to us, you must contend for the faith, what he's actually saying to us is there are going to be people that are going to attack it. There are going to be people that are that it's going to be under assault. And you have to contend for it, right? Look at Acts chapter 20, what Paul says to the to the uh, Ephes, to the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. He says in verse 27, Acts 20, 27. We're almost done here this morning. Our Sunday school hour will uh, pick up the second half of this next week. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, right? Right after he says, I declare to you the whole counsel of God. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. What do you feed him with? The word of God, the counsel of God that I just gave you, that I've declared unto you. And he says in verse 20, uh, 29, For I know this. He said, I know this. I'm confident this is, uh, this is going to happen, right? I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The, the wolves that come in with a false doctrine, they don't care anything about the flock. They don't care anything about the flock. It, that doesn't matter if there's casualties. They don't care about the flock, right? Uh, they're not sparing the flock. Also, of your own selves, even in, in the midst of your own selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you, every warn every one night and day with tears. So what was Paul doing for three years in Ephesus? He was contending for the faith, right? He was preaching the word of God. He was pre protecting and watching over the flock, and he was contending for the faith. He was standing up for that which was truth, right? Biblical and truth. And so we see Paul emphasize the importance, yea, the necessity of feeding the church of God with sound doctrine. The, uh, this acts as a defense for the sheep. When the, when the sheep are fed sound doctrine, it is defending them. It is protecting them. The very real and applicable truth that in order to fight properly, one must be healthy is absolutely true in Christianity. The reason that people fall to false doctrine is because they're not healthy in good doctrine. We must feed regularly on sound doctrine. We must also have a balanced diet as well. The whole counsel of God forms our spiritual food pyramid. We often see people who are strong in one area, but they're weak in another area when it comes to the Bible, right? They may be really strong on certain things, but weak in other things. The Bible says we need to have a balanced diet. Right, we need to be we need to be shaped by the whole counsel of God. Uh, uh, many times, when somebody's str really strong in one area and another area of doctrine is raised and they and it's communicated and it's taught, um, if they're not strong in that area, they'll take offense to it. Right? They think somehow it's an attack. And we know that the the Bible is not contradictory. Uh, that that all that is in the Bible is true. And so. Uh, 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 there are times when it, that, that causes problems. And so we must feed regularly on sound doctrine and have a balanced diet. And so these truths that we feast on regularly are under constant attack from the enemy. And so it's our duty, especially as pastors and teachers in the flock, to contend 
uh, to contend for the for and teach sound doctrine. And Paul admonishes Timothy to do this very thing in his first epistle. He says in 1 Timothy 4.16, he just said, listen to, listen to what he says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. This is going to be a protection for the people that you're ministering to, right? And then likewise, the same admonition is given to Titus, as he sent back to ordain elders in the churches that were established on the Isle of Crete, he says in Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as you've been taught, that he may, he may be able by sound doctrine both to con uh, exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There's a way that sound doctrine, when taught properly and defended properly, protected properly, helps to convince those who are gainsayers or helps to protect the flock that is under attack. And so doctrine, sound doctrine, the faith, is vitally, literally, lifeline, vital important, of, of vital importance to the church. When sound doctrine begins to disintegrate, the foundation upon which the church is built, the words of the apostles, the prophets, and the Lord Jesus Christ, must have at some point been compromised. It must have been compromised, yes. Amen. Uh, right before it, verse 15, I think. Sure. The brain, that's what brings the message of life. Right. Right. Sure. Sure. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's finish with this statement. It really comes down to an issue of authority. Will will we continue to submit to the authority of God's word that has been given to us, the faith that has been given to us, once delivered to us? In order to do so, we must recognize it as precious, valuable, and vital. It must be diligently studied and then continually taught to the church. If it is not, uh, then then we are we are setting ourselves up for failure, right? If we are not we, we're not uh, um, uh, uh, aggressively, I, I guess you would say, teaching sound doctrine. Uh, in the modern church today, the modern Mar American Christianity especially, uh, there is just this drought of doctrinal teaching, right? Uh, every message that is preached is seven helps to, to make you a better husband and, you know, you know six things to, to, to change your, the dynamic of your family and here's how you can be a good employee. And everything is, is just overly emphasizing the practical, right, and the foundation upon which all those things our built is the doctrinal, right? And if we're if we emphasize the doctrinal, the practical naturally flows from that, right? And and so we must we must emphasize the doctrinal, the the sound doctrine that is in the Bible. But people don't like that because it it requires work to teach doctrine. It requires work. People people just like the, like the benefits, right? We we just like the the practical application, but we don't like to dig in and actually lay the foundation. Right, in order to build this building, a foundation had to be laid. Right? And when a foundation is laid, you know what? It's hard work. Shovels and throwing dirt around. And dirt's heavy. Right? You pick up a shovel and start up James, dirt's heavy, right? <laughs> uh, that's what he does for a living. Dirt's heavy. And in order to build a proper foundation, you gotta move dirt. You gotta dig, right? And and once that is all done, all the digging is done and the foundation is poured properly. You can build a good solid structure on top of that, but you try to build that structure without a good foundation, without the hard work that's down that nobody ever nobody ever really sees after it's all done, right? Nobody ever sees it. There's big concrete pylons underneath this building that hold up the floor. Nobody ever sees. You just take for granted and you walk on it all the time not thinking anything about it, right? You have the luxury of not thinking about it, but somebody had to dig 
and lay the proper foundation in order for this to continue to stand. And that's what doctrine is. You have to dig and lay the proper foundation. And it's hard work sometimes, right? And people don't like it sometimes, but they don't realize that they don't realize the benefit that you have once you have done that. That's the problem with much of the church today. The foundation has been been eroded and, and it's been discarded, and nobody's willing to go down there and, and go back and dig again and say we got to lay this foundation again, right? So this church is, is is strong on top. Amen. We're we're out of time for today. Unless there's any just a, a one or two questions or comments, then we can stop here. Anything? All right. So we're going to be talking about in this series our confession of faith, right, as a church. That's where we're leading into this. And I'm going to give you a little history of, of doctrinal confessions from the time of Christ until now and show why they're important, what the purpose of them were. And so next week is going to be a really kind of a, a lesson, a, histor a history lesson about confessions of faith and creeds and confessions that have happened out through the ages, through the church, through church history, and show you why they were significant, why they had to form them, and why they're still important for today, why it's important for our church to have a confession of faith. We say, oh, the confession of faith is the Bible. That's great. The Mormons carry a Bible too. Right? The J JWs carry a Bible too. So to say, oh, my confession is the Bible, what that doesn't mean anything. The JW picks up the same King James Bible and he can distort doctrine just like anybody else can. So this doesn't necessarily mean anything. We say, this is my confession, when somebody can take it and can misinterpret it. What, could, what a confession does is confession makes clear what we believe about this. That's why it's important. Amen? All right, let's pray. We'll take about 15 minutes and we'll have our morning service. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity we have to open the Word of God, Lord, and see the importance of sound doctrine, of, 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 of con, uh, having a concise confession of faith that states that faith that was once delivered unto us so that it's clear what we believe. Lord, we know that people uh, uh, play funny with the Bible all the time. And Lord, we uh, want to make sure that we don't do that. And so that we have a, a, a guide, Lord, that leads us uh, down uh, down this uh, this path of, of shoring up and shoring, uh, Lord, the 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 faith that was delivered to us that we uh, that we believe that we live by that we adhere to that directs us and drives us and guides us and 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 uh, uh, moves us along the path of uh, living out that faith for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what we we desire. Help us, Lord, with that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll